Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real honor to be on the virtual stage with Sally. So as you just heard, Sally is the co-founder and CEO of Elva, an innovative financial company by women for women. Sally also comes from a very successful career on Wall Street. She was the CEO of Merrill Lynch, among other well-known financial investment companies. Um, we'll be hearing a little bit more about that, but since this is a financial literacy panel, oh, also I should introduce myself before I get into some questions. Um, I'm Elizabeth Buckwald. I'm a personal finance reporter for MarketWatch, where I write about all things that have to do with money. It's a pretty, pretty broad topic, but it's great because I get to delve into how we could manage money better and what's wrong with the way we're managing it right now, which is perfect for this session. So, Sally, the session again is on financial literacy, and it's a pretty broad term that people hear about, but they might not understand exactly what it means. So I'm curious in your mind, what is financial literacy? What does a financially literate person know? Yeah, well, I think it's sort of like, what is, what is literacy? If you're literate, you can read. It doesn't mean, you know, you can read, you understand every last word of the English language, um, or you have a PhD in English. You know, what it means is that you have, you know, the ability to understand and use, you know, various financial skills, understand various financial terms. And, and so therefore being able to manage your personal finances and to do so in a way that doesn't cause enormous amounts of stress. Mm. Yeah. So one thing that people do to kind of assess how financially literate they are is they take these quizzes online and assume them embedded in articles. They get at things like compound interest and inflation. Are those the best way for people to assess if they're financially literate or is there a better way to find out? Well, who, who doesn't love a quiz? I mean, who doesn't love a quiz? I think what's more interesting than, you know, the, the outcome of the quiz itself is that what it tells us relative to how we feel. And what we know is that women actually are more financially literate than they believe that they are. That, you know, how good are you with money? Not not so good. We'll take the quiz, you know, for your, you know, to see what, what you know. Oh, oh, okay. I mean, I don't know everything, but I know quite a bit. Whereas gentlemen um, believe they know more than they do. This is, you know, I believe solely caused by the fact that society gives them these messages. Mm. That men are given messages that money is your domain. You are good with money, go go trade some Bitcoin, go do some GameStop. And, and by the way, if you don't feel like you're good with money, then, you know, don't tell anybody because it is such a, you know, important mm -hmm. part of, of being, you know, a masculine individual. Um, and they get that those messages from journalists. Um, you know, 72% of articles targeted to men on money are positive, grow, trade, invest. 90% of articles to women on money are negative, um, guilt-inducing, right? Don't buy the latte, don't. It's all about cutting yeah. expenses and you're, mm -hmm. you're spending too much and it's gaslighting, right? Forget about it, don't pay attention to the gender pay gap and the fact that you pay more for your loans, right? And you, you spend more for your kid, don't, don't look at that. Right. It's the facial. It's like, and women are, you know, such rule followers, like, oh my gosh. By the way, the other 10% of articles are patronizing, pretty much. You know, I tried to look in prep for this panel through a couple of women's websites for what they were serving up for women and money. And I went through three and, and it was nothing. And the fourth, it was, you know, what to wear to work to impress. <laughs> um, so it's, so, so women, you know, just, ah, oh, I'm just not good at it. I'm just not good at it. Plus, of course, we were brought up you know, and socialize that it's important to get an A, it's important to be perfect. And so, yeah. you know, if I don't know everything, then mm -hmm. I know nothing. Yeah. So how do you remove that barrier from everything to nothing? It's, you know, two huge ends of the spectrum there. Yeah. A lot of people raise the idea of having mandated financial literacy classes, which is oh. the case in six states. Is that something you think would help? No, I, I you know, am astonished that you know, we don't have this as a, um, you know, uh, a must take class in middle school, in high school and in yeah. college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my son's hasn't been in high school for a bit, uh, but when he was in Manhattan, um, he had to take a woodworking class, but there were no personal finance classes on offer. Yeah. And 
I, you know, I don't know where, where, you know, y'all are in LA. I don't know how much wood whittling goes on there. I can tell you in Manhattan, nothing, right? There are no jet, you're not a lot of jet clampets here. Um, so I think it's, it's, um, it's absolutely part of our school curriculum. Um, but the other answer is that we should be funding people, our venture capitalists should be funding people to build financial offerings for different groups of individuals. I mean, today, oh, we serve everybody, you yeah. know, say the investing firms, and then you look at their client base and you're like, no, you don't, you know, you're, you're the mm -hmm. vast majority of your clients are men. Mm -hmm. And Elevest was the first and only, um, you know, FinTech built by women for women to help women invest and not in a, we are girls investing together, but mm -hmm. in a, hey, you know, women live longer, their salaries peak sooner, we die later, we need to take that into account. Hey, women are really motivated by investing in ESG or investing for impact. Mm -hmm. And the street has been slow in catching up, we'll offer that. Um, you know, hey, we're 75% women, you know, so yeah. we reflect you. And we, you know, I, so I think building things for people, not in a look at us together, but in a deeply researched way mm -hmm. is, is important here. And the venture capital industry isn't, isn't funding anything. Yeah, no, you raise a lot of very interesting points there. You know, in college, I was in business school myself, and it wasn't so much that I was dominated by men, but they were the ones who felt more comfortable answering questions. And, you know, they always looked more confident going into an exam, even if they mm -hmm. didn't end up studying or anything like that. But one thing I did in college was I joined a women in business club just for women, you know, men not allowed type thing. And it was very empowering to have other people share stories and they'd bring in speakers. But then I got to a point where I was like, hey, you know, I feel like I could make it to the big leagues and, you know, go back to having the men. Is the idea with Elvis to, you know, separate women and bring them together so that they can learn in a safe environment and then just go out to the big leagues like what I wanted to, or is the idea? No, 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 no. Yep. See, look, look at how you've been socialized too. You have, you have been socialized as have I, has, has everyone here that for women is junior varsity. Mm. That's what you just implied that Elevest is a junior varsity offering. So we'll come together and we'll do the learn junior varsity things. And then we'll go to the, you know, the big guys to invest. Why, why does that have to be the case? Why can't something for women be more sophisticated, be more yeah. user friendly, be more effortless, use more ETFs when we mm -hmm. construct our investment portfolios in order to give a broader asset allocation? Um, you know, be, be, be the one that, you know, um, does the, you know, automatic glide pathing to make sure that it's adjusting to get you to your goal. Um, you know, to be the one that um, is offering some of the most cutting edge um, in ESG investments in particularly around gender. So yeah. um, yes, is it a place where women can come to learn? It is. Our community at Elevest is the most active in financial services, that we mm -hmm. are something like, according to third parties, 80% um, of Instagram activity, um, yeah. FinTech and, and wealth management space. Um, mm -hmm. so, and there's a newsletter where we've got, I don't know, you know, three quarters of a million. Uh, we have several million in the, in the community, three quarters of a million signed up for the newsletter. We have tons of content. We have career coaches. We've got certified financial planners, yeah. private wealth advisors. You know, there are lots of ways to learn. And there is an incredibly sophisticated investment offering online and through through financial advisors as well as banking. Yeah, that actually sounds to me like the normal investment apps might be the JV team and Elvest is the varsity team. Well, we were named number one by Nerd Wallet for uh, retirement investing, which is the you know the most important kind mm -hmm. of investing because of the fact that we are the only ones that take gender into account now. If you don't take gender into account, it's okay if you're a man because you earn more and you die sooner. I mean, I'm sorry to tell you that. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it means you have more money. So for yeah. the existing industry, as they're building it, right? Yeah, that's good. It works for the average person. It just doesn't work for women. Yeah. All right. And the mm -hmm. other thing we were named number one from Nerd Wallet was an ESG, environmental, social, and governance investing, 
which you can do at Elevest from, so we have no investment minimums because frankly, they're sexist and racist um, because who has the money? White men. By the way, I love white men. I've been married to a couple of them. I think they're amazing. It's not against them, but they were the ones who had the money. And then folks who had less money couldn't invest. So you can invest with as little as a penny at Elevest. You know, a dollar gets your diversified investment portfolio. Um, but you can invest for impact, you know, um, for environmental causes um, from your first dollar at Elevest, which is, mm -hmm. again, maybe not unique, but certainly rare. Yeah. So, so you started Elvest in 2014, um, which was a time where obviously social media was well in use and people were gradually feeling more comfortable speaking out about injustices online, women in particular, about highly vulnerable times in their life, um, miscarriages, abortions, all of that. Um, you know, I wonder to the extent that that helped empower you to start Elvest. Do you think you would have had the same you know, passion and, and fighting power at a time when that wasn't the case, that women were told to speak only when spoken to? Well, the, the time has certainly been right, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you point to social media, you know, you could, we could just as easily point to the Me Too moment, you know, um, as, as also being a catalyst, which of course was enabled by social media. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, I think we were sort of a, a, a bit before, for that because it was really on the election of Trump. By the way, we launched the day before the election of Trump uh, because we thought we we're gonna have a female president. So we're like, what a great day to <laughs> launch an investing platform by women for yeah. women since we're gonna have a woman president. Um, and that, you know, you could just feel the tide of anger amongst certain groups of women. And, you know, immediately, they didn't immediately go to, I need to call Elevest, but intuitively every single one of us knows that money is power. And intuitively, every single one of us knows that women will not be fully equal with men until we are financially equal with men. Intuitively, right. just look across the women who are saying, this happened to me, this happened to me. And it was a power imbalance, yeah. which and again, in a capitalist society means a money imbalance, right? It wasn't, you know, wealth, you know, women who were the CEOs who this was happening to. It was women who were in vulnerable positions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think we were, you know, right time from that perspective. And I think every, you know, we, we recognize that today women live smaller lives than men do in general um, mm -hmm. because of this. And, you know, you can't quit the job. You can't leave the relationship because you don't have enough money. You can't start the business because you don't have enough mm -hmm. money. And there was really, I think, among some men, um, certainly, you know, where I spent my career on Wall Street, who when we launched you know, first did the this is dumb and junior varsity and silly and, and mm -hmm. even women, by the way, there was a woman who used to be a friend of mine who, who wrote an article was like, this is stupid. <laughs> you know, like, like, like it's dumb. It. <laughs> yeah, other people have tried, they failed, yeah. it's dumb, you know, no, you're solving the wrong problem. It should be the gender pay gap. I'm like, yeah, because we can only work on one problem at a time. Right. Um, and, and I think it went from that and then a little bit of a defensiveness of, but we serve women, don't look at the numbers of clients, to any number being like, hold on, wait a second. Do I want my daughter to have a smaller life than my son? Mm, actually, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're starting to see sort of our, our dad squads you know, men of a certain age as their girl, as their young, um, their daughters are going out in the workforce who become some of our biggest, you know, boosters and fans. Mm -hmm, definitely. I'm curious how you guys measure success at Elvest. You know, what are the metrics you look at that make you so happy you want to, you know, run and get on a TV screen and tell everyone to go on Elvest because you're doing X, Y, and Z? Or what are yeah. some of the personal anecdotes you think about on days that might be kind of rough? Well, every day is sort of rough. Everybody's like, do you just love being an entrepreneur? Like, no, I do not. Actually, yeah. you should only do this if you if you just have to, right? If, mm -hmm. if you have such a burning idea and it needs to be done in the form mm -hmm. of a startup. You know, but the, the best moments, which just are just off the charts, is if I have an LFS bag now, you know, I'll get stopped on the street. And you know, some woman, typically young woman, do you, oh my gosh, I'm with Elevest, are you with Elevest? You know, and I'm like, oh, I'm the CEO of Elevest. <laughs> well, a few have burst into tears. One touched oh, me. Wow. And the reason for this is that money is women's number one source of stress. 
the number one driver of her confidence in her future is if she's taking action around it. So LFS is actually sort of helping to solve her biggest source of stress. I mean, you know, we, we spend so much time with women, physical wellness and mental wellness and emotional wellness and spiritual wellness and uh, financial right. wellness is the ticket, right? It, you know, if you don't have that, you really don't have a very strong foundation. And so I love to say we're taking money from a source of stress to a source of strength. Now, right. you know, there's that sort of, you know, anecdote, the proof is in the numbers. And, you know, we have had, I think amongst the industry, one of the highest percent of organic new clients, those who were not bringing in through Facebook ads, uh, which has driven our cost of acquisition down um, mm -hmm. because the word of mouth is so strong, which, you know, means that the business is, is definitely achieved product market fit, you know, and now mm -hmm. is really on a path for, for real growth. Yeah. Um, I should mention also for the audience, I believe there's a Q&A thing. You guys can submit your own and I'll try to ask Sally some of those. Um, but for now, I'll get back to some of the questions that I had. Um, so again, you, you mentioned a lot of financial stress or a lot of stress with women in general is financial stress. And kind of when you have that intact, you live a better life and all that sort of comes together. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, it helps. So, yeah. That doesn't guarantee happy, happiness, guarantee, but yeah. it sure helps. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that you've mentioned in a lot of your talks is that women underinvest. We're not as confident about putting our money into the stock market or really anywhere and kind of just stash it aside as literal cash. And I wonder to the extent to which you think the, the pandemic might stop women from putting more money in the stock market. I mean, we saw wild days where the stock market had to be halted. You know, the yep. stock exchanges yep. just couldn't handle the volatility. And, you know, people saw 401ks drop. Why should women want to put more money in when you yeah. could lose it? Yeah. So easily, um, <laughs> which is always uh, the case. It's so. such a great question. So first of all, if, if I go back through LMS background, you know, the first sort of nasty thing that was said was, you know, women, women aren't going to invest their risk averse. You're never going to grow. Mm -hmm. Then we started to grow. Um, and then what we heard was, well, yes, they'll invest during a bull market, but they will freak out, yeah. you know, during a tough market because they're not used to investing. And, you know, the, and, and obviously women are emotional and, you know, I mean, hormones and, and all that stuff. And so during those, as you were mentioning, tough periods in the market, we would send out emails, stay the course, stay in your grade. Women would reply to us, I know, like you told us that already. And you don't yeah. have to tell me again. And I would every day go to our CX group and say, hey, you getting any, no, nope, no big uptick in volume. At the same time, you were having other places sort of crash. Mm -hmm. um, so fast forward to today, um, during that period of time and through last year, we had net inflows every single week. Mm. Um, even when the industry had outflows in which the, the weeks were as bad as the prior worst months and where our annualized attrition rate never went above 4%. Uh. So they stood their course and there's just a new piece of research and, and apologies to whoever pulled it together because I can't remember who the source was, but it just said women, men were much more likely to freak out than women. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, now what's ca so I actually think the opposite. I think what we went through it, it can help encourage women to invest more because a gender difference is not we're risk averse. Mm. You know, the gender difference, as mentioned, is nothing has been built for us. But one gender difference that, or one thing we see among women is women tend to believe that the stock market does this, right? And they just, yeah, remember when it crashed that time and it crashed the other time? When you know very well, the stock market historically have done that. Yeah. And for anybody who's been worried about, well, when do I get in? I feel like the market's frothy. First of all, you have no idea, you know, unless you are, you know, a full-time trader. And even then, you know, you're, you're not, a mar you know, I, I don't think you're a market genius who can, who can call tops that everybody else is by definition missing. Um, sure. But if you had invested on any in the stock market, not traded, invested on any given day in the past, you know, since the 1920s, and you just let the money sit there, 
and you do not touch it for 15 years, your chances of a positive return over that period of time are 99%. If you invested the way Elevest recommends, which is a, you know invest and then a little bit out of every paycheck, it was 100%. And so yeah. stocks historically have been risky in the short term, but it has been riskier to leave your money in the bank in the long term, because in the bank, you know you're losing money every day because that interest rate doesn't keep up with inflation. Yep. And yeah. so what we're seeing is that whereas, you know, there's some good news before the pandemic, the gender pay gap yep. was beginning to tighten slowly, slowly. The gender wealth gap has been increasing as the racial wealth gap has been increasing in part because white men are investing more. And so they get that ability of compounding that has yeah. been a positive for their wealth, which others have missed out on. Yeah, um, that's the perfect leeway into one of our audience questions, which is what are ways that women and other marginalized groups of young people can start a conversation with peers and friends about money and investing? Yeah, um, we, you know, we are facilitating some of that at Elevest, um, you know, because folks can find it difficult to have those conversations with their partners, um, it, though you should. By the way, the more often a couple talks about money, the more hap the happier they are. Mm -hmm. And on the opposite end, the less they talk about it, the less happy they are. On the worse end, there's very little, if any, domestic abuse without financial abuse. And so I don't know my chicken or my egg, money, power, et cetera, but you know, getting those conversations. Now, the other thing I would say is that women have been reluctant to talk to other women about money because they're filled with shame. Mm -hmm. And that whereas for men, money's power, strength, independence, for women, it's loneliness, isolation, uncertainty. And the research tells us there's no amount of money she makes that she doesn't feel weird or embarrassed about. And if you think mm -hmm. about it, you know, your friends, oh, I, I'm, I'm making a lot of money, but my friends work harder than I do and they're yeah. not. And, and I feel so bad for, I gotta keep it, you know, I don't want to talk about it. I'm maybe not going to wear this ring out tonight. You know, so there's that. But then it's, oh, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I'm not making, you know, my friends and I can't yeah. afford it. And my parents took out the loans and are yeah. that, right? I see you like, yeah, I know. I oh, know. yeah, no, I mean, this just sounds like very familiar. Every, <laughs> everybody's nodding their head because yeah. this, because it's every woman. Mm -hmm. um, and there is something about women's friendships where, there's research on this where, where men can, you know, have different hierarchies in their friendship, but for women, it's very much about this equality coming together. And so money is such a weird thing. So mm -hmm. I think you, you know, look, we're trying to start that at Elevest in our community through workshops where you and your partner can come and with, you know, sort of five other couples work through with a coach, how to divvy up money and what your relative values are, et cetera, or, you know, together with, a hundred women working on budgets or, you know, and by the way, we, we let, we let men in and certainly, you know, absolutely um, have any number of non-binary clients mm -hmm. as well. So we're, we're for women plus, um, but it's, you know, you can do that if, you know, I, I don't understand it, but you don't want to do it all of us. It's just picking your, you know, choosing friends carefully about it because for some, they're just going to be not as far on that journey. And so yeah. you want to say, all right, over, you know, two glasses, maybe four of wine tonight. This is going to be the topic of conversation. Don't want to surprise anybody, but I'd really, as I gear up for asking for this raise, love to talk to y'all about how you've done it and how I can invest the money on the other side or whatever those things are. Right. So not bringing it upon an abrupt way, but kind of gradually introducing it so that people have the opportunity to prepare mentally, if not obviously the easiest topic to discuss, no. but you know, something that we should be discussing more. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a good strategy. Um, another question from the audience that you kind of touched on a bit there, are you doing any marketing around and to dad fans to establish them as a loyal group? Yeah, we should, you know, we should. We, we um, as a startup, which is uh, venture funded, you know, from, we have some great investors, you know, Melinda Gates is pivotal, Penny Pritzker, Venus Williams, um, a lot of, you know, um, ESG venture funds, um, you know, so we have to be very um, stri strict, disciplined on how we spend the money. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, dads, we do have our dad fans that are such a new group for us that our cost of acquisition from that will be so high, you know, and there's so many women out there that it's just mm -hmm. much more efficient for us to engage with the women. Once yeah. we, you know, you know, are bigger and are churning out all kinds of cash flow, um, that will be the time to bring in the dads. Mm -hmm. um, another last question from the audience, and then I'll get to some final questions I have. Um, huge fan, someone writes, capital letters, huge fan of your social media. What's a typical planning session like with your social media team or posters? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because we have such a talented team. Um, yeah. You know, when we started this thing, you know, it was, it, uh, I was involved in everything. And, and what's been so fun is we've been successful and scaled is that, um, as you, you've noted, and, and I'm, I'm biased, but I don't think too biased, you know, we've, we've really got great creative teams who represent our user base, our community. Um, you know, we are 75% women, we are 50% in many groups, 50% plus people of color, we're 20% mm -hmm. plus LGBTQI identifying. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for me to try to get in and, you know, be involved in the social media is probably suboptimal, you know, for mm -hmm. individuals who, you know, reflect a cross section of our community to do it is, is um, you know, is the right way, but they, they have a blast. I think they're you know, what we're trying to do is be smart, you know, smart, informative, and, you know, have a laugh at the same time when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one final question for me, I think we've covered a lot of pieces here, a lot of ground. I've personally learned a lot from this conversation, found it very insightful. So I'm very, once again, honored that I had the opportunity to lead it. Um, but so, someone leaves this conversation right now, goes back to doing work, goes back to their Zoom meeting. What's the one thing you'd like to leave them with? Or what's the one area they could go to for more help or more to learn about this? But bottom yeah. line, what should they take away from this conversation? Yeah, so um, what, what I would say is that first of all, it's just not as hard as the industry makes it sound. You know, there is so much jargon um, but when you get to the bottom line, you know, for investing, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are just some key things you should know. You want to have a diversified investment portfolio. Don't invest in one stock. You want to keep yep. your costs low. You want to have more equity and risk if you're younger, less if you're older. You know, right. you want to do business with a fiduciary like Elevest, who's responsible for putting your interest ahead of their own. Right? There, there are a handful of things. We're all on our website, you know. You want to, before you ever invest, you want to get your credit card debt paid down. You want to get yep. debt that has interest rates above seven to eight percent paid down. You want to, you know, while I was, you know, saying bad things about um, bank deposits, you do want to have three months of take home pay to six months of take home pay. You know, as we've learned in the pandemic, you want to be investing in your 401k, particularly okay. if there's a match because of the tax deferral. And from there, you've done that, then you invest. That's almost sort of it. Yeah. That's almost sort of it. Um, and I said it fast, but come over to lfs.com and look at our magazine and there's a lot of information there. What I wish I could do for, you know, particularly women who aren't investing, um, you know, who, who have the, where, the means to do it. And that doesn't mean millions of bucks or even thousands of bucks. It means you've done, you know, sort of gotten that credit card debt paid off. I wanna put a clock on your wall that shows you how much you're losing by not investing every day. Yeah. And for some women, we've done the calculations, you know, we'll say, oh, you, you know, your gender investing gap, not investing as much as the guys do, just on a percent basis, not, you know, because guys have more wealth, but just getting the majority of your wealth, you know, into, um, into the markets, into investing, you know, that costs you hundreds of thousands for some women, millions of dollars over the course of their lives. And it's so funny, Elizabeth, because people will be like, yeah, I got it. I'll get to it. Yeah. We translate it to per day. It can cost women a hundred bucks a day. Not the first day you don't invest, but because of the massive power of compounding over the course of a life. And so, you know, I say to people, if you, you know, and they're like, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. You're like, look, if you had a purse that had a hole, in it and a 
hundred dollars fell out today. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow you go back out and another hundred dollars fell out of it. And the third day and the fourth, like yep. how long would it take you to fix your friggin' purse? And the answer is not even the day, right? No. <laughs> you, you know, and by the way, signing up for an Alabas or any of those takes 15 minutes and yep. historically has been by far the highest return thing you could do with 15 minutes yeah. by far maybe won't be in the future past performance future etc but i'm always willing to bet on the vibrancy of the u.s economy which in turn drives you know yeah. over time and then creation of new businesses which drives um you know the stock market 